With a filmography that includes over 90 films, Haneda Sumiko is a prolific director of documentaries. She began her career for Iwanami Productions in 1949 in the company of several other prominent filmmakers of her era. After mandatory retirement, she founded her own independent company and has continued to make films since 1976. Her works cover a wide range of topics, including the arts and artists, education, the environment, and Japan's aging population. In this interview, Dr. Irene Gonzalez Lopez teaches us about the life and career of Haneda Sumiko. Irene Gonzalez Lopez is a lecturer in Japanese studies at Birkbeck University of London and research associate of the Visual and Material Culture Research Center at Kingston University. Her research spans Japanese creative industries with a special focus on post-war cinema and issues related to gender and sexuality, both in front and behind the camera. In 2018, she co-edited the first English language book on actress and director Tanaka Kinio. Tanaka Kinio, Nation, Stardom, and Female Subjectivity, Edinburgh University Press. Other publications include Marketing the Panpan in Japanese Popular Culture, Youth, Sexuality, and Power, 2018, In Search of the Authentic Japanese Taste, Solitary Gourmet, and Cultural Tourism, also in 2018, The Profound Desire of the Goddess, Sexuality and Politics in the Insect Woman, in 2017, and Mizuguchi y los Últimos Días de Barrio Rojo, in 2016. Irene is currently working on a monograph on the representation of sex work in Japanese cinema and an edited volume on documentary director Haneda Sumiko. Hello, Irene. It's so nice to see you and talk with you today. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, Today, you're going to be talking about documentary filmmaker Haneda Sumiko. So to begin with, I'd like it if you would just introduce her with some bio- biographical background, uh, who she was, what did her career look like? She's still alive, so what does her career maybe still look like? So can you introduce us to the director, please? Yes, hello, thanks so much for inviting me. I'm really happy to be part of this amazing project. And yeah, Haneda Sumiko is fascinating filmmaker. She works on documentary, she worked on TV and, and both on TV and cinema. And, and she was actually born in, in China, in a place called Dalian, in, in, Northeast, in Northeast China in 1926, born to a Japanese family, quite progressive, quite culture. Her father and her his father were teachers, and she actually recalls on her in her memoirs that she never felt some kind of gender discrimination in her family, that she dreamt of being an astronomer, a politician, that she really had this, all these like, big dreams and then as she was growing up she kind of felt like oh I'm not too good at math so maybe not astronomy (laughs) and that's how she but but you sense this kind of of freedom and aspiration in in her memoirs and when the war is almost at its height for Japan in 1940 Two, uh, she actually moves to Tokyo from China Mm. to study in a place called Jiugaku, which means freedom school, which was a a progressive Christian girls college. And there is where she meets Hani Atsuko. So Hani Atsuko is a very important woman in the life of of Haneda because she's the mother of Hani Susumu, who's a very famous director of documentary. And she's also the daughter of of Hani Momoko, who's considered the first female journalist in in Japan. So we can see again this kind of background of of very cultured and independent uh, women in her life. And and it's through uh, Hani Atsuko that she gets recommended to work in Iwanami, who this, this is a production company, and she starts working in the photography library kind of thing, organizing and editing photography. And, and soon after she joins, they create the film production side of the company. And she's again, promoted to get into, into that. So she starts working as a script writer, as an assistant, as an editor. 
and it's in 1957 that she actually directs her first film. And I mean, she was 31 at the time, so quite impressive. If you remember at the time, I mean, a few years earlier, Tanaka Kinuyo has debuted as film director, mm -hmm. uh, more or less at the same time as Haneda, another woman, Tokeda Toshie, debuts in Iwanami as well. Mm -hmm. So there's this context, historical context of things happening in terms of, of female professionals and female filmmakers. And she works in Iwanami for around 25 years until the age of 55. That is when women had to retire. Uh, men could stay in the job for longer. Surprise, surprise. Right, yes, yes. <laughs> um, I think she's very prolific at Iwanami, but she's also... Uh, you can feel in her writings that she was looking for something else. So as soon as she retires, she starts making her own films independently. And as an independent filmmaker, she made more than 20 films. So her first independent film is The Cherry Tree with Great Blossoms, which is mm -hmm. a, a beautiful mm -hmm. documentary that is also kind of an arty art film it's, it's very hard to describe it's is it's, it's beautiful it mixes a lot of genres and different conventions and sensibilities I don't know it's a very interesting film so mm. she makes more than 20 films as an independent filmmaker mm. her last film was uh, produced in 2012 she was 86 yeah, yeah, 86 at the yeah. time. So, yeah. you know, that, that gives us an idea of the amazing energy and motivation uh, Haneda has. As, as, as you were saying, she's still alive, living in Tokyo, but that was the last film she she made. So for me, she's she's very interesting, of course, because of her work, but also mm -hmm. about because of this biography and all the... I think it's very interesting, as with Tanaka Kinuya, when you have professionals that have worked for such a long time, mm -hmm. that you can see the history of Japanese cinema, in this case, through their career. Yeah. And, and that's what I find really interesting about Haneda as well. Oh, thank you so much. So this is an incredibly dynamic person. Uh, I love this description of her with these big ideas and these big aspirations. And, you know, she she follows through with her life by, by delivering on this and, and realizing some of these ideas anyways, right? Um, so I want to go back just a little bit to talk about uh, how she started out at Iwanami and then transitioning, you know, after this mandatory retirement uh, to her, her own films. Um, you've talked about how she started out in editing and, and photography curation, um, but what was maybe some of the process or the steps required for her to, to become a director, uh, both with the studio, the new studio, and then maybe on her own? Can you talk about mm -hmm. that a little bit? Iwanami was a very um, dynamic place at the time, and it's actually the house of many uh, famous directors of documentary emerged from that same period. So mm -hmm. we've talked about Hani Susumu, but you've got Ogawa Shunsuke or Shimoto Noriaki and Tokieda Toshie as well, and, and many others. So there's this, it's a very dynamic place where a lot of young filmmakers are are working and and they're 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 working together with um, Yoshino Keiji, who's kind of the mm. the one that is organizing all the projects and and leading this young group of of filmmakers. And he's very he's got a lot of experience, but he also trusts them very much. Both Hani and Haneda talk a lot about how he used to really show a lot of interest in their work. If they wrote a script, it's like why do you wrote this, how do you envision this, and, mm -hmm. and really engage with their ideas. So Hani Susumu got promoted to director very quickly without actually even being an assistant. And, and Haneda, for what she, she writes, she, she's written a couple of books about her experience as filmmaker, which is great as well, right? Because you can read directly what she, or how she frames it or how she remembers, but at least it's her own voice. So she says that, you know, she got into the company a bit because she was recommended. She, she didn't have like a clear goal. It's not like she wanted to become a filmmaker straight away, but she obviously had very good skills for writing. And, and storytelling. And I think we, we, you can tell that in her films as well, uh, in her films that she directed. But, but basically it was Yoshino Keiji that was like, why don't you work as an assistant? Why don't you work as a scriptwriter? Why don't you yeah. direct your own films? So it was seeing her work that he decided and he kind of encouraged her to take uh, bigger positions. Now, as a, as, a, as a woman filmmaker, I think it's, a, as we were saying, it's a special moment in history. There's the legacy 
of, of the occupation and the, the gender reforms and, and this promotion of, of women professionals in different spheres. But there's also this kind of cosmetic uh, gender mm-hmm. equality. So the, the Ministry of Education, after the end of the occupation, the Ministry of Education has this big plan about social education. So they're putting a lot of money into um, education films into creating community centers and special or for example film libraries in little towns mm-hmm. and also creating women's groups and women's education mm-hmm. and and this kind of, of of civilian grassroots yeah I want to say movements but at least some kind of 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 local mm-hmm. activity in that sense so this is also how Iwanami gets a lot of money from from the state from the Ministry of Education uh-huh create these films, uh, this kind of education films. And this is exactly the time when Tokie and Haneda get promoted to directors, uh-huh. uh, which is great. But at the same time, we, we have to acknowledge that that too much of a coincidence, especially considering right. after that, right. when the ministry start fund, stopped funding this kind of films, there was no other women being promoted to director within Iwanami. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And and of course, documentary film is was more accessible to women filmmakers uh, than than the fictional feature films of the studio system. Yeah, any any filmmaking industry was more accessible than the major studio system, of course. But still, uh, there's there's not that many women that were able to 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 make films on a regular basis in documentary yeah. film in Japan. We have early cases like. Atsumi Taka, who was a proletarian filmmaker, or Miyagi Mariko, or Kumagai Hiroko, but 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 there's not that many. I think that Haneda is one of the most prolific. Thank you for that. I think it's important for people to realize that, you know, even if people may aspire to be a director or to work in film, that it doesn't just happen that there are these larger structures, um, and some of them could be government initiatives, right, <laughs> that, that's funding that, that directly funnels, in particular, this director's career. And you've met mentioned now that documentary filmmaking or educational filmmaking was more accessible perhaps for women than making narrative commercial film with the, with the big studios. So on that note about accessibility and experience, what was Haneda's experience like working for, for Iwanami? Did she, you know, experience any um, kind of, uh, well, their support was there, but also did she have any influences? Were there any suggestions about the type of films that she would make or the, the kind of working conditions that she had? Yeah, I, I was I was saying before that Yoshino uh, was was very supportive, but of course this was a, a company that was on the one hand getting uh, funding from the state, and on the other hand mainly making films from from for companies like what they call PR PR films. So the the Haneda herself says in in her books that most of the films she wouldn't even consider them documentaries because oh. there was the the it was very clear what the script should be like there was not so much freedom from the in, from the filmmaker to make decisions and and she she really gives at times this sensation that they were just you know kind of not mass producing but but just making all these films that were commissioned with not much of a say. But because of this funding and because of this trend of the social education films, she she was mainly put into culture films and women's issues films. Mm -hmm. But she also did some science films, which was part also of this educational project. But she says that when Japan enters the, the so when when she's debuting as director, Japan is already entering the high economic growth. Mm-hmm. And, and more and more is this PR films that are leading the sector. And, and that's a lot of factories, dams, construction sites, this kind of of documentary films. And those were not perceived as being so appropriate for women directors. She doesn't really get into details, but she she says that it was mainly male uh, colleagues that would get um, chosen for those kind of projects and she would get more the kind of culture um, films. Um, she doesn't seem to mind. She doesn't seem to be too interested in doing the the dams and the factories. But but there is this kind of distinction. Mm-hmm. Um, Haneda 
is critical with with uh, the gender ideologies of 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 Japan, and she does say that there's a pervasive inequality and discrimination. But she's always quite. She 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 often says, and and I've interviewed her, and she's uh, emphasized this quite a lot that for whatever reason she has not felt she doesn't feel that she has experienced um direct discrimination because of being a woman oh interesting and she yeah. has this incredible support that is surrounding her so that's undoubtedly yeah part of it, right? yeah i think she 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 recognizes she's somehow also lucky and privileged because we were talking about this background right she's a she comes across as a very self-confident uh, individual but also so in at Iwanami, she meets um, Kudo Mitsuru, mm -hmm. who works for the Ministry of Education, and it's mm -hmm. collaborating in, with Iwanami in these films. And actually, he then moves, uh, quits the Ministry of Education and starts working in Iwanami. Mm -hmm. And when Haneda retires, he quits as well, and he becomes her producer, and they create this company together. So she's also... And she talks about this a lot, that she's also always been working with her husband as producer. And by the time they became independent, both of them were very prestigious, very well known. They were mature filmmakers. So, you know, they also had this aura of, of I guess, quality and, and prestige. Mm -hmm. and, and she realizes that that has also helped her a lot, that probably her experience has nothing to do with a young filmmaker that suddenly wants to do sure. um, <laughs> yeah. in films independently and doesn't have this, well, the producer and this network of, of support. So on that note, I'd like to ask you, you know, she's coming from this network of support, these institutional structures, um, but then also she's channeled into, you know, culture films or women's issues or women's, um, you know, experiences maybe uh, while she's working at Iwanami. Do things change when she founds this independent production company do you notice a shift in her work or subject matter yes and no I mean one thing that I think is interesting about Haneda is that considering how extensive her filmography is it's it's, it's very diverse I mean, of course, we can identify some certain elements that seem recurrent, and we can talk about that later. But already working at Iwanami, she does she does challenge a bit what is being expected from her. So, for example, she has this short film called Dedicated Treasures of Horyuji Temple that was commissioned by the a National Museum in Tokyo. And it's a short film, and it's, it's beautiful. And it starts like a typical museum film with this male voiceover authority explaining the history and the value of the objects and and, and the this man's voice is, is silenced by a girl's voice that starts interacting with the objects in a much more evocative dreamy way kind of imagine who's using them mm -hmm. uh, what the people that use them thought about them so bringing life into this object from a completely different perspective quite poetic and it's very interesting and of course the, the museum were a bit like mm, this is not what we were <laughs> expecting uh, so she did try to certainly put her um you know her stamp there in in her films but then once she became independent, she has very, very personal films, like her first film uh, as an independent filmmaker, Cherry Tree with Grey Blossoms, is dedicated to her sister who passed away. It's a very oniric film, uh, again, mixing different uh, narrators, voiceovers that kind of challenge each other or, or seem to complement each other in a way, but it's very personal. Then she's made films about her own origins in in China and, and in occupied territories mm. and and how uh, she's made films about the the orphans, the the, the Japanese um, children that never made it back to Japan after the war. So uh, understanding also that privilege that that mm -hmm. she was able to return and 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 how as an as as an adult 
older, I mean, quite late in her life, she starts reflecting on that as well. So she makes very, very personal films, but mm -hmm. she also uh, takes uh, projects that are commissioned. Of course, she she's able to put many more conditions. So she did a, a biopic about Hiratsukaraicho, the feminine, mm -hmm. and there's this network of women who have created a commission of research in Hiratsukaraicho, and they they ask her to make the film and she says yes but uh with the condition that I get to do whatever I want and nobody's gonna tell me what to do mm -hmm. and I mean the film is, is is very interesting but I wouldn't say that it's like a super radical <laughs> approach to, <laughs> to Hiratsukaraicho but still she she make it clear that you know she didn't want any intervention but she continues to do a lot of films about arts and culture mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She's really into into crafts and traditional arts, performing arts. It's not I don't know if whether it was through her work at Iwanami that she she got into that, but that certainly goes through her entire career. Well, so now that you're talking about specific films, um, I do want to ask you uh, about she she has such a diverse body of work mm -hmm. covering many topics, <laughs> working in different contexts, right? Different production contexts. Do you see a kind of trajectory or any kind of consistency in her work over time, uh, or or is it really just fresh from project to project? I, I, I'm so interested that you mentioned this uh, introduction of shifts in narrative tone, maybe of giving us different subject positions as a as a way of tweaking the expectations that she's working with, um, or are these uh, narratives that are uh, quite personal that give us a different viewpoint that we might not actually see. Um, from other directors so yeah I'm curious is it is it always fresh or do you see consistencies she does get like into I mean you can see the freedom of of her as an independent filmmaker in the sense that she gets into making films about the about age in Japan about the elderly uh -huh. and about the caring system in Japan at the time that she's actually taking care of her uh -huh. of her parents and in the late 1980s and she made three four films about that mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. you know she gets the she 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 got into that subject and she explored it from different perspectives and mm -hmm. she can do that mm -hmm. uh, or she made um, a series of film uh, about a kabuki actor called Kataoka who's very famous in Japan and she made five films about him oh, wow. that is all together as a, a project mm -hmm. and then there's this um, shorter like one version that it's adapting part of the of the first film with some parts of the others that was made for an international release but but you know you can see that she gets this um i mean freedom that that uh, if mm -hmm. if she was working for a company that it would be very rare to do those things but it's hard to see a clear trajectory like i would say that in terms of of themes she's very interested as i was saying in craft in art in performing arts mm -hmm. and in the art itself as an in the artist in in this kind of completely dedicated physically mastering the art uh, so she has this film about kataoka the kabuki actress she has two beautiful films about a contemporary dancer akiko kanda and she's very interested in in the body the dedication but also the sacrifices that that entail from the people around that person mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. she, she's always I think what is interesting about her is that she might be making a film for example Ode to Mountain Hayachin is about folk and folk traditions and the vanishing rural Japan but she there she's putting things about performing arts she's mm -hmm. making subtle comments about gender issues so many of her films, I think, have different layers. And that's for me also something that is quite interesting. I've been working on, on Haneda with um, Marcos Centeno Martin and Alejandra Armendariz um, and, and with Ricardo Matos Cabo, who's a, a, a film curator. And, and actually, the other day we were discussing, like, can we see a trajectory like hmm. definitely going more into this or less into that? And it's not that, well, one thing is, of course, that the access of the films is very hard to get access to many of her films. We haven't been able to get access to all her films. Um, and, and therefore, it's also quite risky to, to <laughs> make this kind of broad oh, no, statement. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Because yeah. You, you don't have all the evidence. But one thing that we saw that certainly happens in her independent and especially in her later films is that she more and more 
puts herself this she exposes herself in her films if that makes sense mm -hmm. either through voiceover mm -hmm. using her own voice putting herself into the film so we see her editing mm -hmm. and explaining oh. why she got into the project for example in women's testimony in the film but which is about labor movements female labor movements in in Japan in Hiratsuka Raicho we see her going through pictures looking from Hiratsuka with her husband so we see the research process the films about Manchuria are clearly not only her voiceover, but she also appears in the film and they're from the beginning frame as, you know, this is my story. This is me exploring my past and I guess the past of my country. So there's there's certainly this, this acknowledgement of making personal films. Mm -hmm. and, and I think I see it as, as also demanding the, the, the audience to acknowledge that it's her film. Mm -hmm. As you were talking about her attention to artists and their craft and everything that goes into the background of their their lives and the kind of work that it takes to create works of art I was thinking I would love to see a, a piece on her <laughs> and everything that has gone into to her work and her craft uh, but it sounds like maybe she's given us some uh, sneak peeks into that through yeah. through her films it's just fantastic um I want to talk about this this issue of access to her films um, in just a little bit, but you've already mentioned that she's written several memoirs. Uh, she does seem to be quite active as a public speaker in participating in film festivals and different collectives. Um, so I'm wondering if you can speak about her public persona a little bit and um, how she presents in film industries or maybe some movements or initiatives that she may have been involved with over the course of her career and maybe still today, right? Because she's yeah. with us, yeah. Certainly she, she has been very active as, as you were saying, especially with women's film festivals in Japan, especially Tokyo International Women's Film Festival that run from 1985 to 2012 and was led by Takano Etsuko or Takeyoko who come from Iwanami Hall, which has Mm -hmm. It's not Iwanami Productions, it's the, the exhibition, uh, the venue. So two very, very important women also in the industry of cinema in Japan. And, and she's very close with them. She's a great collaborator of the festival, of all the publications that are connected in one way or another uh, to the festival. So Takano Etsuko and Otake Yoko create this network of, of journalists, critics, um, producers, directors of women, and they're into the festival is only just one other way of this um, networking and this solidarity, I think that they're trying to, to create. So Haneda is very active in that. With Alejandra, I, I've done a, a project about the, the label of a female director, how female directors are spoke of in Japanese media, in Japanese film festivals, and, and searching for pieces in the media, in the press, in general press and and film journals like Kinema Jumpo, articles about Haneda, I found that she was not that often labeled as female director, mm -hmm. but only as director, which is interesting. And, and we can think of several reasons, perhaps because she, we were saying she was already a very prestigious and mature filmmaker when she started. And maybe the label was more used with younger filmmakers. I mean, your work is, is <laughs> super interesting in how filmmakers are depicted and the the the, the public persona so uh maybe you can also tell me about that. <laughs> uh, but but yeah that I saw I, I, that actually caught my attention she she's given a lot of interviews she she's I would say she's very honest and and aware of herself as I was saying about the the kind of privilege uh background and and perhaps also lack you know being in the right moment at the yeah. right uh, time in a, in a way but one thing that also was interesting to find out when we interviewed Tanaka is that because of this um, active uh, involvement in, in, in women's cinema circles uh, we were surprised that she did not consider herself feminist she didn't think there was a particular feminist perspective in in her work which I personally read in a lot of her films mm -hmm. Um, and she considers she she does acknowledge that of course there's there's many of her films that are concerned with women's issues or with women's um, female historical figures 
uh, women labor movements, things like that. But she says that it is only natural that her being a woman, she would be interested in other women, just like she's interested in Manchuria, just like she's interested in artists, right. in performing arts, right. right? So like she doesn't see that as, as, as above or major uh, above other, um, other of her identity and, and yeah, the, the different elements that create her positionality, so to speak. Yeah. I, I find that to be very common with many of these directors that they, you know, they're like, well, I'm not really pursuing a feminist project. I'm not, you know, that's not really the lens that I have. And I think we we could acknowledge in part that that, that has to do with the way that feminism is perceived in Japan, you know, and that, you know, there might not be quite an understanding of, of what that means in a larger context, uh, right? So there's a lot of baggage that comes with, with the term. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. What, yeah. what does she understand when she says feminist? Right, right. Uh, right. And what do I understand when I say right. feminist, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's good for us to acknowledge that, um, but this is yeah, yeah, a very common, a very common uh, public position that people take. So I, w I would like to return to her works a little bit, um, especially since many of the people that will be watching uh, this video might not have access to Honeyness Films. Um, so in your opinion, what do you think are maybe some of the most striking films that you've experienced? And it would be very helpful <laughs> if you could pinpoint which ones people might be able to find uh, if they if they do a little digging. I mean, certainly Cherry Tree with Great Blossoms, her first film as an independent filmmaker is, is beautiful. And I totally recommend that film. Her first film, Women's College in the Village, is a short film. It's very interesting also because of all this institutional background that is very obvious in the film. It's, mm -hmm. it's, a very, it's almost a propaganda film in a way. And it's, yeah, it's, it's 1957, but in a rural area. So it's, it's very telling, I think from Jap about Japan of the time and about what were the official discourses trying to present rural Japan as, uh, yeah, that identity. Other to Mountain Hayachine, mm -hmm. uh, which won the Fine Arts Award of, of the Ministry of Education is a beautiful film, super interesting. And this is one of the films that really mixes a lot of her themes like the the issues with rural Japan and vanishing Japan in the post-war era, uh, performing arts, folk culture, traditional culture, gender issues, gender divisions in the community. So it has many layers that are very interesting. I'm a big fan of, of the first film about Akiko Kanda, mm -hmm. which is called Akiko Portrait of a Dancer. That's 1985. Uh, Akiko Kana is a very peculiar uh, character, very dynamic and very charismatic. And, and Haneda, again, mixes her voiceover with Akiko's voiceover. Mm. And it's a very interesting way how she's given Akiko a lot of freedom to express and tell her story from her own perspective. But at the same time, through the editing and her own voiceover, um, framing it in a, in a certain way. Uh, so that's a great film. I'm a, I really find Into the Picture Scroll also very interesting. This is a film about Ega, e, e Rakimono, so uh, a picture scroll. Picture scroll. scrolls, yeah. <laughs> just, yeah. It, and, and just with editing and music, you really feel it's coming alive. And it's amazing how you can be looking at that for an hour and a half or whatever, and don't, and you, you'd really feel it's moving. It's, it's, <sighs> it's, it's very peculiar. It's, it's very powerful. Um, the problem now, the second part is, very, very difficult to access these films. Mm -hmm. Some of them have been released on DVD in Japan. Mm -hmm. um, Kanatasha, which is the company that, um, that takes care of, of Haneda's films, is, is quite open to like, if you want to organize screenings and things like that, she, they have been amazingly helpful with us. Then there's um, Ezo, in a Hoson Center, which is like the institution that it's um, keeps um, uh, is it's uh, keeps the a lot of documentaries from Japan and you know, preservation, sorry, preservation of documentaries um, that also have a lot of her films, but otherwise very difficult. Mm, that's why last year we organized a couple of online symposiums 
where we were able to screen some of our films free online. And we did a couple of, we worked with some film festival like Kurtisan in Belgium and in London with Open City Doc. And the idea is to organize more screenings because mm -hmm. I think that's the only way, yeah, that's the only way we, we are we're going to get more attention right. into her work because that's the major problem. It's right. not accessible. So I have two follow-up questions to that. Um, and one is about this difficulty. So typically with commercial directors, often the difficulty is just a language barrier. So often the there will be DVDs, for example, but the DVDs just won't have subtitles um, for languages for international distribution. Um, but this seems to be more difficult. So <laughs> what what is the barrier here to her films? I mean, certainly the language barrier that you're talking mm. about is is very important. Uh, the the Kanatasha tells us they don't have the money to create subtitles. So what we did for this symposium that we organized online was actually create subtitles. So we, oh. we paid a translator to create proper English subtitles and that we, we gave to Kanatasha so that now if they want to, or if someone approaches them, they can screen those films with subtitles. So that was part of the intention of the project and that we hope we can continue to expand. So yeah, funding, please. Yes, <laughs> but, thank you for Yeah, it's that. very yeah. difficult. Kanatasha is basically one person. The, the company is just one yeah. person who's yeah. amazingly uh, efficient and dedicated, but she's just one person. Um, right. So it's very difficult. I think there's also partially these networks that we were talking about, about women in Japan, uh, mm. the women's film festivals and women's network that were very big in the 80s, mm -hmm. very big in, in Japan of mature women mm -hmm. that were extremely active in the cultural sphere. And that kind of in a way died with that generation there hasn't been such a big follow-up or or perhaps yeah but perhaps it's more right to say that the new generations are into other types of culture or other types mm -hmm. of projects mm -hmm. uh different from the style of Takano Etsuko, Takeyoko mm -hmm. and, and this generation but the fact is that compared to the amount of screenings that I've heard from, from Kanatasha that were made in the 80s, 90s, there's many less now. I see. Ah. Well, thank you for your work and, the, and what you're doing. And on that note, my second follow-up question was, um, you've mentioned the symposium that happened last year, the screening projects that you're doing. Uh, what can maybe we expect to see from you in continuing to work on Hanida's work? Are there, are there plans? Do you have projects? Yes. So we're still working with Alejandra Mendari Fernandez and Marcos uh, Centeno. We're working on a book, on a book on Haneda. And the idea is to try to cover uh, an unedited volume. So we're working with uh, scholars across many disciplines. Uh, and the idea was we, we don't want to, um, we, the idea is not to give such an altruistic approach, partially for because what I was talking that uh, she's very diverse, very heterogeneous in style, in themes. Um, so what we wanted to do is kind of explore her cinema from different perspectives. So there's going to be scholars working on anthropology or on aging society or on um, eco cinema and environmental issues. Uh, women and gender uh, studies. So uh, because her, her, her filmography allows for that, it, uh, we're trying to make it quite an, an interdisciplinary project. So we'll see how that goes. And, and ideally more screenings, yeah. Fantastic. That's, that's, that's what I hope of myself. Yes, I do too, I hope so too. Thank you so much for speaking with me today. Thank you for the work that you're doing as well, um, particularly for one of these directors that is just so hard to, to see your work. You're doing such an important work of just visibility in addition to scholarship. So thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart. And it was really wonderful to speak with you. Thank you, Colleen. Thank you for giving me an opportunity because this is another great platform to get more people interested in Haneda or at least learn about Haneda and start, you know, getting the word out there. So thanks so much. Yes, hopefully, the, hopefully it works. Thank you. Yes.